Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming back for the second day of this event. A uh, couple things before we get started. The first is that all of the video from yesterday is now on YouTube at youtube.com slash the Centos project. So if you missed anything yesterday, you can uh, go watch that later today. Um, and we have slides up for a couple of our presentations from yesterday for people that asked for those. Our first presentation today is uh, about OpenStack and their relationship with, with CentOS. And uh, for our presenters, we have Alfredo and Javier. And I will let them go ahead and I will get out of the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rich. So hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are going to discuss today how OpenStack became boring and successful. Uh, so let us first introduce ourselves. My name is uh, Javier Peña. Uh, I've been part of the OpenStack engineering organization in Red Hat for the last uh, six and a half years, approximately. Um, well, I have spent most of that time working in the RDO project. And I am Alfredo Moralejo. I joined Red Hat about 10 years ago, and I've spent, well, at firstly as consultant, and I've spent my last four years working as senior software engineer at RDO Project. Okay, thank you, Alfredo. So what we will discuss today will be first, we will talk about the OpenStack's uh, journey into stabilization and how the OpenStack deployments have been evolving over the last few years. Uh, then we will see how RDO and the CentOS Cloud SIG have helped in this evolution. And finally, we will see what's, what's the future ahead for us. So, uh, OpenStack's journey into stabilization. So, many of you will probably be familiar with the Gardner hype cycle. So, in a nutshell, it describes how emerging technologies are usually adopted, uh, especially uh, new technologies that uh, originally start uh, small and then they get a lot of hype and then after some time they end up being, being useful and successful. So, so we have uh, taken this uh, hype cycle from Garner and we have identified some key dates in the OpenStack history and we can see how some of them translate into more or less this same kind of uh, hype cycle. So originally, the OpenStack development started back in 2010 as a joint project project of Rackspace and the NASA. Uh, it quickly gained momentum and started getting support from a lot of large companies and startups. So we could say this uh, peak of inflated expectations happened around the Paris summit in late uh, 2014. So if you were around at that time, uh, you probably saw that a lot of marketing money was being spent there. Uh, we had so many large companies uh, throwing money at OpenStack and saying, hey, this is the future. This is uh, where we want to, to fix all the problems of the world. And it was called the cloud operating system back then. So as it usually happens, then hype started to decline a little bit. And uh, we saw that uh, for some time, there were some consolidations in the industry. We saw companies being acquired by other companies. Uh, some startups uh, were, were bought by other companies and several large companies ended up quitting the project when they didn't see the quick return on, on investment they were expecting. So by the end of 2016 or early 2017, um, we could think that uh, the project had lost traction uh, and hype slide, uh, uh, quickly moved to elsewhere. So we could say Kubernetes took over and now it's uh, in the peak of uh, it, its hype. While OpenStack at that time seemed like, well, no, nobody had interest in, in it anymore. However, that was the time where after going through this uh, throw of uh, disillusionment, OpenStack started maturing. And we could say that today, in 2021, the project is not only it's still around, it's also strong. Uh, it's still one of the three project, open source projects with uh, the highest number of contributions. Uh, but, but we could also say that its features and limitations are better known and understood. So it's starting to get to mature and there are multiple organizations still using OpenStack and getting it 
getting it to to production. So for example, uh, these are just some well-known public examples of companies that are using OpenStack at scale. So we see, I mean, we're, I'm, we're not going to go through any of these companies, but we see that, that there are representatives in many different sectors. We have finance, we have uh, research with the CERN, we have cloud providers. And in most of these cases, in most of these cases, these companies were already presenting at the OpenStack, at the Open Infra Summit back in 2020. So it was last year. So this isn't, these are not companies that used it like five, 10 years ago and, and are no longer using it. There are some other examples uh, which are not from the Open Infra Summit, but they're also from previous uh, events or, or have been publicly discussing their OpenStack uh, usage in the last one year, one year and a half. So what I what I want to show with this uh, slide is that we have multiple companies from multiple different sectors using OpenStack as, at scale today, and they are getting a lot of value from it. So if we try to discuss money, it's usually a, a bit more complicated because it's it's quite hard to have to find public revenue figures from OpenStack since companies do not tend to to publish uh, figures for their individual uh, product. However, we know that the last year the the open infra foundation published uh, a document uh, created by 451 research that projected a 7.7 .7 billion dollar us 7.7 .7 billion dollar open stock market by 2023 up from around 5 billion in this in this in last year so uh, they had a similar document a few years ago that projected 5 billion us dollars in 2020 and that uh, document proved to be true, so that there's a lot of money to be made on OpenStack. Also, uh, there was a, another report from the Open Infrastructure Foundation stating uh, that they had there were 10 million cores in production back in 2020. Uh, the latest uh, statement I saw a few days ago was 15 million cores, and that's an awful lot of cores in production. Uh, we can also say the the NFV use case is, is very strong, as we as some of you may know there are multiple companies there are a lot of uh, telco companies working on it and, and something very interesting is that uh, the there was a massive growth in usage in some regions originally we saw openstack being used mostly in north america and europe but asia took over and uh, and in the openstack user survey told us that in 2019 and 2019 yes that we there were almost 50 percent of the survey respondents back in uh, 2019 were using openstack in asia so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, growth in that area so so all in all we could say that the, the openstack market is still profitable for companies working on it and yeah it's around it's mature and now companies are making money so now Let's discuss how OpenStack deployments have been evolving over the last few years. Uh, the, the Open Infra Foundation creates a, a very valuable tool for this called the OpenStack User Survey that anonymously collects data from existing deployments and users. So users uh, have to anonymously go to a website and provide information on their deployments. And it's a, it gives us a, a very nice picture of the current OpenStack real estate. So first, we will go to the cloud sizes. Um, it's interesting to note that between 2015 and, and 2019, which is the latest data we have, cloud sizes have not changed that much. So we see around 70% of the clouds have less than 1,000 instances and less than 1,000 cores. It's also expected we don't have that many large organizations requiring a, a cloud with a million instances, for example. But it's also... Nice to know that uh, yeah, the 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 private the average private cloud size is uh, is kind of uh, stable, so it hasn't changed that much. However, when we uh, when we try to discuss the deployment status, things have changed a lot, and we see a, a clear a clear trend. Uh, if we go back to 2015, we had a little bit more than 50% of the deployments running in production. And now, in 2019, when the hype has passed and, every, and everyone knows the limitations and, and its uh, features much better, we have more than three quarters 
of the of the deployments are running in production and full operational. So it shows us that uh, when the hype was at, at uh, its peak, many organizations were still yeah testing around and testing the waters and seeing trying to understand what OpenStack what was uh, good for. Now they know and now they're using it and now they're getting value and that's that's good. So if we discuss the workloads, we see a, a similar trend. Uh, things haven't haven't changed uh, that much as well. Um, there is one interesting point in the infrastructure services area. We see that uh, it has gone up from 50 to 66% in 2019. And that might be caused by migrations from other virtualization platforms. So now that we have a stable OpenStack cloud, let's use it for, for our infrastructure services. But uh, most of the other uh, areas, workloads are yeah pretty similar. They're, they haven't changed uh, that much. Something interesting is uh, NFV, Network Function Virtualization. We can see that it's exactly at the same percentage, uh, at 23%, both in 2015 and 2019. So it means that yeah, companies that probably were testing NFV on OpenStack back in 2015 are probably now using it in production. But yeah, the absolute numbers haven't changed uh, that much. And finally, we also see edge computing is a new use case we started to see in uh, in 2019 that wasn't there before. So, so when we see all of this, uh, one of the most interesting uh, charts is this one uh, that discusses uh, how people, if people are net promoters of OpenStack or not. So. It looks like the perception on, on OpenStack maturity and stability, and stability hasn't changed that much. Um, we see around roughly 50% of the people would uh, recommend OpenStack in, back in 2015. Kind of the same uh, amount of people would do the same in, in 2019. And that's interesting because even if the product has actually matured and evolved, the projects have actually become uh, more stable, uh, the perception hasn't changed that much. So people who liked it back in 2015 are still likely to enjoy it uh, this year, but people who were yeah, skeptical about it are still skeptical. So yeah, so so ish. Uh, and finally, if we discuss the operating systems, we, we will find a very very interesting trend. So if we if we go back to 2015, we see that more than 50% of the deployments were running on Ubuntu server. And roughly a quarter of those uh, deployments were running on CentOS. However, if we move on, if we if we move on to 2019, we see that the situation has changed. Um, CentOS was uh, the most used operating system, and if we group CentOS and RHEL and Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, deployments together, we have more than 50% of the deployments are running on RHEL or a RHEL derivative. And that's interesting because that's more or less the same amount of, uh, of uh, deployments that moved down from uh, for Ubuntu server. Um, this, is, this is interesting in, in two ways. First, because deployment is still mostly done using uh, Ubuntu. So the, the upstream gates uh, in most of the projects are running on Ubuntu. However, deployments have moved over to, to run on CentOS. And while we, we like to think that uh, the RDO and CloudC communities have had a bit part in this change. So this is a, a small pat in the back for all of us because probably we did a, a good job in, in changing uh, the way deployments were, were done and, and the perception around OpenStack running on, on CentOS. And well, we did it. We, we got the number one, of, uh, the number one in deployments. So next, let's see how RDO helped and the cloud seed helped to, to, to make this shift in, uh, in deployments. And for this, I will pass the microphone to my colleague, Alfredo. Thank you, Javier. So in this second part of the presentation, I will try to explain what we think that are some key factors of why this grown, growth in in CentOS and how that we think that RDO project and the CentOS SIG has helped. I also think that this can be a good example of how SIGs can, can help some other projects. And I hope that it will encourage others to, to participate into the project. 
So first, I will I will start explaining what RDO provides to the to the community. Let's say so. The first, okay. So, uh, okay, perfect. Thanks, Javi. So the first thing that uh, RDO provides is the tooling and, and some infrastructure for for maintaining the RPM packages for for OpenStack on on CentOS. When we started the project, one of the goals of this was to provide a smooth uh, user experience for the upstream developers of OpenStack projects to participate in RDO. So we choose to use Gerrit as peer review tool and to use also Sula and Nodepool and as CI systems. Okay. So this couple of screenshots show, shows our Gerrit instance that we use for well, many different things. First, to review all packaging configurations, all the spec files for the ones that are familiar with packaging. And but not only that, we also use use it to automate some other stuff as for example to handle the promotions of packages from uh, testing repos to production repos and the different releases so we apply a, a peer review to everything that we do in the in the project we think that this has helped to open start uh, uh, sorry upstream developers to participate in the project next slide please Javier. So to give you some numbers of how big or how small we are, so this slide shows how many packages. We are packaging more than 300 OpenStack repos and more than 400 dependencies. We are more than 60 maintainers on last release, which is not huge, but a good, a good uh, amount of, of, com of uh, people contributing. And we had more than to uh, 2000 builds, RPMs builds in, in CVS, which is, well, I would say, uh, good numbers for these kind of communities. Next one. So one of the first things that we realized when working with our community is that, uh, well, we had different kind of users. First, we had a, a community of people trying to use or using OpenStack to provide their internal or public OpenStack that we use cloud operators. Their main goal was the stability. They want to provide good service to their customers and a very controlled uh, environment. So they don't have to update every day. They have they want to have control over what they install in their clouds. They want to follow the upstream releases. Okay, this is let's say the the most usual case for for operators. And for those cases, the cloud sync repos which are provided through the standard uh, CentOS mirrors was a great fit. But we also observed that we had other other users, mostly developers or people working upstream in, in the project who wanted to have uh, packages or commits available as soon as possible. So for those users, we had to invent something or to get something new, which we call RDO trunk. In this RDO trunk repositories, we follow a continuous delivery approach into packaging. Javier, please, next slide. Okay, so for those, uh, what we try is to provide packages, RP, RPM packages with every single commit that is merged upstream on any of those 300, 300 repos uh, and make them available to the users as soon as possible. This repo doesn't have as many requirements in terms of quality or stability. For example, they, those packages are not signed. Those packages can be deleted when they are newer packages, so they are not maintained over time. We don't have such a, a control environment to build, but they are still very useful, especially for the developers community. Okay, we call that RDO trunk, and what we did for that is to create a specific tool which we call DeLorean, which uh, automatically follows the master or the branches upstream for the projects and create the packages as soon as they are they are merged. Okay. So those packages are used, as I said before, mostly by developers, but not only by developers. Okay. They, uh, they can be used also, for example, especially for some users that want to test a new feature, which is under development. It is not in in release uh, builds or release versions yet. They can use this, okay? And to do this, we had to automate as much as possible, okay? 
Okay, as I explained before, we are we have more than seven hundred packages into the into into RTO now, and we are supporting three or four. Depending on the time, we are supporting three or four releases, the master and and two or three uh, stable ones, and we are not that a big team. We are mostly three four people full time with the support of the infra of another infra team but we are not that much. So we have to automate as much as possible. We are automating the builds, the builds for new releases. So every time there is a new release upstream, automatically a reviews proposed in RDO to be built and promoted into testing and, um, and release and production repositories. Those builds will also be validated as part of the promotion. Okay, and we also, uh, trigger new builds on, for example, dependencies updates or things like that. This has allowed us to maintain uh, well those those many releases and packages with uh, with uh, uh, people well not that big. Okay, so we have been using Software Factory as automation tool. I'd like to mention that Software Factory is a bundle package, let's say, of several tools that are very useful to maintain this kind of projects, not only packaging projects, but also any other software project, which includes things like Gervit or Zool, not Pool, or some other tooling. This is called our good friends of Software Factory are providing that, providing us with that. Okay. And that's what RDO did. And also, I'd like to focus a little bit more on the SIG itself, okay, because the Cloud SIG, uh, we think that it's providing good value for this kind of packaging project, okay. And the first thing that is helping us is to making our users much happier than it used to be. So uh, the first thing that uh, that one of the most important thing that SIG provide is repositories, uh, repositories infra based on the official CentOS mirrors for production and uh, well. Buildbox CDN for testing. So they provide uh, uh, a geographically distributed network of mirrors distributed across the operating system itself, which makes consumption very easy. But not only that, also provide us a way to make uh, to the users very easy to configure all required repositories. As you see in this in this slide, you just need to conf to install one package for this case, for example, for the last release re for RDO, which is called Victoria. So you just have to install that package and you will get all the repositories included, not only OpenStack ones, but repositories for other six that are, are also required for to install OpenStack. This, may, this makes our user experience, I would say, very smooth and easy to introduce into the OpenStack world. Also, we created and we maintain over time a, a tool, a specific tool for quick deployments of OpenStack, which is called Packstack. This is intended only for proof of concept and small environments in one or two boxes, but it's still very easy for, for people that just joined the project and wants to test any specific feature or OpenStack as a, as a new tool. Okay. But Packstack is not enough for production ready. We know that. So we also cooperate or collaborate with other their deployment tools project, which are intended to be product ready for production as triple O, Cola, or well, any other that may be willing to, to, to join us. Okay. Next one. Also, uh, from security and quality point of view, SIG is also helping us to, to, well, to ensure that we are providing secure repos and, and properly tested. Especially nowadays that, well, security in supply chain is a hot topic after some recent security issues. Uh, CBS or CentOS is providing us an environment where we can control the process of building, sign and push packages and we have visibility on the entire chain from where a package is created until it's released into the, the mirrors. Okay. In fact, in the last well, in the last in the last uh, releases, we are implementing also GPG verify to make sure that the content of the packages is the same that is released upstream, which is kind of an issue in some cases now. Also, as mentioned before, CentOS mirrors 
it uh, provides a highly available distributed network, which is also ensuring our quality of service for, for users. And finally, from the, value, from the uh, quality point of view, we are also testing that RDO keeps working when there is updates on CentOS itself or even in other six. Finally, I've mentioned some time, but I want to go a little bit on, on more detail about how is collaboration with other projects. In some cases, we uh, share the interest or share packages with other projects. For example, we several projects like Obird or even OpenShift are using Open, Open v Switch or OVM projects, or what. there are some other examples where different different SIGs has common interest. So uh, SIX provides a common way to build packages, to consume packages, and this makes much easier to collaborate between us to, to reduce the content of the packages that is used, these packages. In this case, for, for Cloud SIG, we are currently collaborating with the virtualization SIG for some virtualization packages like Libvirt to QEMU, NFB for network related stuff, Ops tools for operational tools like CollectD, things like that, or RabbitQ from Messaging SIG. Okay, but well, this is not done. So this is still a, a process, a always changing process. So I'd like to use uh, the last slide to, to share with you what's our plans for next year, let's say for next for next time. Our current goal, current focus now is of course CentOS Stream. So we are now in the process of moving to CentOS Stream. Our goal is that the next release, which will be about April or May, will be released on CentOS Stream 8 only. Okay, so it will be built and validated using CentOS Stream 8. We also plan to support during this year 2021 uh, the stable releases like Usuria and Victoria in both CentOS Linux 8 and CentOS Stream 8. So this can help some users transitioning from CentOS Linux to CentOS Stream. So having these pivot releases that are supported in both. And well, yesterday I think there was CentOS 9 was mentioned in some in some presentation yesterday. So our plan is to start working with it with CentOS Stream 9 as soon as it's, it's released. We'd like to start getting ready for it. We cannot provide any time or any timelines, but just our intention of start working with it as soon as possible. And last thing, during the last year or so, well, we have been very active, I would say, in building packages, providing packages and all the technical stuff, but maybe not as active in the communication part or in the event parts of the SIG. So we want to revitalize that and to start going to, to doing more frequent SIGs and well, been more welcoming anyone that wants to join, both for OpenStack itself or even to add other cloud-related projects into the Cloud Seek. That we we know that Cloud Seek is not the same as OpenStack, and if any other project related to cloud is interested in joining in creating packages for CentOS, I would recommend to come to the Cloud Seek and start working with us. We can help them to to make this a success. This is the way you can easily find us. Okay, you have IRC, mailing list, and periodic meetings. So, we, as said before, we are glad to receive anyone and to support them on on make their projects a success. And I think that's it. What do we have ready? I don't know if there are questions or anything that you are interested in. Well, I don't see any questions. Um, so thank you. Thank you both for this uh, for this great presentation. And uh, we wish you much luck in the coming year. Thank you. We, uh, thank you very much. Our next session will be in 30 minutes. And in the meantime, we encourage you to join us in the hallway track. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have a question. Lance asked. Uh, how the change from uh, CentOS Linux to CentOS Stream will affect downstream users. 
I would say it's, uh, well, the question I think is if how many of them end up switching to something like Rocky Alma, have no idea, to be honest. We, well, we, have, we think, we th my personal opinion is that, uh, well, CentOS Stream will still be a good operating system to run RDO or to run OpenStack as it was uh, yesterday, there was a brilliant presentation from Brian about CentOS Stream, how patches will, we will land in CentOS Stream. There will be gating CI. So I expect that CentOS Stream will stay still stable and able to run on on for a good platform for CentOS. The what's production ready is something that each one has to decide for its own deployments. So I will. That's something that everyone has to deploy. But I I think that. CentOS Stream will keep being a good platform for it. I don't know, Javier, your opinion on that. Yeah, well, we can share some examples. Right, right now, we are testing CentOS Stream with the, with the Wallaby release, so with our Geo trunk packages, and we are not having any, any special issues. So it's it's working just as it was working with uh, CentOS Linux, Linux 8. There's always some detail that uh, whenever there's a new package that might break something, but we also have that with uh, with minor releases of CentOS Linux or with CentOS from 8.2 to 8.3, for example. Uh, so we we did that, and well, we sometimes we had some minor issue that we we had to fix, and it's always been working fine. So I don't expect yeah. any any big change in in yeah, in fact. That, that's something, yeah, right. Uh, thanks, Javier, for pointing that. So we have been testing RDO on CentOS Stream for some months already. Um, well, we didn't have too much issues, to be honest. So, yeah. so I see there was another question by David. So we said cloud is cloud stick is not OpenStack. So how how extensive does that work for extend? And can we give an example of what we consider out of scope? Um, so, what, <laughs> do you have any? Uh, so, uh, uh, to, to consider, well, I would say that, for example, some project are uh, there is another there, there is another SIG which was uh, well past SIG for platform as a service. So, anything that is pla platform as a service as Kubernetes or those kind of things is not intended for Cloud SIG. Cloud Seek is focused on infrastructure as a service project. Okay. So everything that can be understood as infrastructure as a service and is open source, of course, I would say it can be a good, uh, a good uh, place for this. Uh, that's what I can say. I don't know if you have any example that you would like to discuss. So, I so don't I have, know all the I projects have... on the world, but yeah. I don't have an out of scope example, but I have an in scope uh, example. So some time ago, there were some talks with the CloudStack community uh, who were willing to to join the SIG. And I mean, that's perfectly in scope. Uh, it's absolutely in scope. So anything like that, I mean, Open Nebula, for example, would be perfectly in scope or anything like that. Uh, and we would be more than happy to, to share the SIG with them and collaborate. So yeah, Lance, uh, he mentions Lance uh, mentions that in theory with stream we should uh, catch any issues sooner. So yeah, that's the point. Yeah. So instead of instead of finding like yeah three four issues at the same time when we switch from 8.2 to 8.3, uh, with 8 stream we would see one issue. Okay, we fix it and then we move on to the next one. In fact, the, the plan the plan in ahead for CentOS is as they explained yesterday is to provide a way to to for community to create some CI jobs to get their updates in as part of the process. So at some point, there may be a chance so we can run OpenStack jobs as part of the of the gating of the CentOS stream, which is, of course, great. So I'm well. There is another question from Lance. Many users, mm -hmm. including myself, tend to be several releases behind. How that will impact our use of streams in it's more of a continuous release. Uh, 
first, I don't know if you, when you say releases behind, you, um, you mean CentOS or OpenStack? You mean CentOS, right? I guess he means OpenStack, actually. OpenStack, because, okay. Uh, because so, that's that's what might have issues with a newer build of. Uh, okay, so we will we will support we will support, for example, now uh, Usuri Victoria and Wallaby. Okay, so we will run Usuri Victoria and Wallaby on CentOS Stream. That means that uh, if you are on any of those in the stream, will not be a problem. We will continuously be testing, validating those releases again in stream, and if. There is some change that is requiring to OpenStack in a stable release of OpenStack to make it work with CentOS Stream. We will make it. So, so that's that's what we that's what we expect. In fact, that's not different what uh, with what we do today with with regular CentOS Linux. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the sense of support here is we 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 validate and if we find issues, we fix it. Uh, uh, so, so it's it's most of, it's more or less the same that we have today with minor releases, but with a rolling release. But yeah, we support uh, during the time that a project an OpenStack release is maintained upstream, which is for two releases, uh, more uh, about eight, 18 months. We will keep supporting that on on CentOS Stream, and yeah. so that's that's it. Yeah, it's, it's also important to note that uh, project, project upstream open OpenStack uh, upstream project that uh, run their CI jobs on CentOS, they're also moving to CentOS uh, stream. So Cola, Triple O, even Packstack will be running uh, on CentOS stream for their stable branches as well. So as if we catch an issue, let's say we one year in one year ahead, we are in 2022. And then we find an issue in in Wallaby for in stable Wallaby for a CentOS stream. We'll have to we'll fix it because we we fix it as RDO, but then it would also affect Cola, Triple O, and all deployment projects testing on on top of RDO. So we we shouldn't expect any specific or different issues. We had similar issues when when moving ahead with point releases in CentOS Linux, so we fixed them just just like that. All right, well, thank you again for this presentation and, and thank you for your questions. Uh, we will be resuming the next session in about 20 minutes. We'll be talking about another SIG, the Hyperscale SIG, which has just started up. It's in the boot up phase. Meanwhile, please do join us in the hallway track and uh, you can uh, bring questions there if you have any more, either, either specifically about this talk or more generally. And we'll see you in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.